So it's 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 my task to introduce Ravi Gupta. Uh, Ravi is uh, joined us in Cambridge just before the pandemic. He trained in Cambridge and in Oxford, uh, did an MPH at Harvard, but is an infectious diseases physician, and has focused his research initially on HIV, has strong links to South Africa with a lab in Durban, um, and came here just after he'd published a paper uh, describing the London patient, the second patient cured of HIV by bone marrow transplantation. Since he's been here, Ravi's had to adapt as we all have to COVID-19. He's done somewhat done that somewhat more effectively than some of us by publishing, I think, five nature papers in the last year on aspects of COVID-19 pathogenesis. Um, and I think he's not going to talk about that today. He's going to talk about his uh, his HIV, HIV work. So Ravi, I'll hand over to you. Um, I'd just like to, before doing that, thank the Lister very much for making these prizes available. We've helped a number of members of the audience over the years. Uh, I think that the two speakers today are terrific um, additions to the, to the list of Lister prize winners and Lister fellows. Um, but I'd like to say thank the Lister Institute for its, its long-term support in this way. Uh, but Ravi, over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Ken, for that kind of introduction. And um, again, I'd like to start just by thanking the, the uh, Lister Institute uh, for the, um, the the prize. And uh, of course, uh, in the sort of uncertain world we live in, um, in terms of funding, uh, doing science uh, and being part of something, uh, you know, sort of a, a group of, of, of scientists who are like-minded is really important for us. Um, and so and so that's a, a really important thing that um, needs to be continued. And, and, uh, um, and thank you again. So uh, I'm going to talk uh, not about SARS, although I really was tempted to, um, uh, uh, but actually more about the work that we we uh, described in the application, um, because I think it's also uh, quite exciting and very uh, and, and certainly linked to so many um, processes uh, that include viruses, but also as you may see, uh, maybe even through to inflammation and cancer. So, um, so in a way, giving this talk is a way for me to kind of re-engage with some uh, something other than SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and and so so that so that's um, uh, hopefully going to reflect in the talk. Um, and so just before we start, uh, the, the two key people here who've done the work I'm going to show you are in the in the red box, and one of them sitting there. One's on holiday, so only a holiday of the year, I hope. Anyway, so um, so let's talk about so so HIV and macrophage reservoirs. So as Ken mentioned, uh, we got interested in HIV cure and trying to purge reservoirs um, some years ago, and um, that stemmed from an interest in macrophages. Um, uh, so uh, HIV in infects two, uh, two types of cells, macrophages and uh, CD4 positive lymphocytes. Um, and many people think that macrophages are not important and it's all about T cells. Um, I'm kind of in the middle, um, but I think what is interesting about macrophages is that they're, um, these are really fascinating cells. And that, so whether, HIV is a, is a, it, whether macrophages are a key player in macrophage reservoirs or not, I think is irrelevant to some, some degree. Um, but HIV has taught us a, a hell of a lot about these cells uh, and the way they respond to viruses. Um, and, and again, these have many sort of other uh, sort of implications. So in the top left, you've got the typical HIV virions with their, um, their capsids. Uh, um, again, you know, in the world of SARS, we're used to seeing spike proteins and, you know, uh, whereas you know, it's quite nice to go back and look at an HIV virion there. Um, so so uh, when uh, macrophages, as you know, are distributed all throughout the body, there are many different flavors of macrophages. Um, uh, uh, the, the lymph node in the left, uh, bottom left, again, classically thought of, of being populated by T, cell, uh, T cells and B cells, but actually there are a fair number of lymphocytes. And if I just take you back to that first slide, that, down in the left-hand corner, there's a, that's a lymph node uh, stained uh, by, with CD68 uh, that's red. So quite a lot of macrophages infiltrating uh, um, that space, as you can see. So, um, uh, of course, lymph nodes are a really key site of HIV replication, uh, uh, and you get uh, fibrosis and degeneration of those lymph nodes over time. Uh, you also have, of course, uh, lymphoid tissue in your gut, and, uh, uh, and um, uh, the biggest reservoir of HIV is in the gut by a long way. Um, but, of course, you also have macrophages in many other parts, including the lungs. And on the right here, I've shown to the, the, the brain uh, and the blood-brain barrier, um, uh, partly because... Uh, of the involvement of the central nervous system in advanced HIV in the form of dementia and encephalopathy. Uh, uh, you have a number of different flavors of, of macrophage uh, lineage cells there. Microglial cells, for example, covascular macrophages. Um, uh, and some of these are seeded from the periphery, from monocytes circulating. And then some are, of course, um, 
uh, uh, they're from a uh, foodsily derived uh, and therefore can replenish themselves. So you have two types of uh, uh, two ways of, of populating a tissue with macrophages. One is that they're either there from birth, they're fetally derived from the yolk sac, and they have a very high proliferative potential. They divide themselves and replenish themselves. And then you have the, uh, the ones that are derived from the circulation, which have a very limited capacity to self-renew. Um, so let's turn to a moment for HIV in the life cycle. Uh, this is an enveloped virus. You can see a plasma membrane fusion occurring up there on the surface. Does anyone have a point? I sorry, I forgot to ask about the point. <clears throat> right, so um, you've got the, they've got a, a fusion event here, um, uh, uh, and then you have uncoating, which actually happens at the pore. This is an old slide where, so, so the capsid comes in here. Initially, it was thought that the, uh, that it uncoats and releases uh, RNA here in the cytoplasm, but of course, this would be sensed by, uh, by, you know, um, by sensors, and, and actually it happens at the nuclear pore. Um, it has to overcome a number of um, uh, blocks. Uh, uh, these are restriction factors such as TRIM5-alpha, uh, APOBEC3G, and SAMHD1 that target these early steps. If it, if it survives all of that, yeah, you, the, the reverse transcription process is completed, and you get integration, um, integrated, uh, mediated by integrase, uh, and of course then you end up with a provirus, uh, which then needs to be transcribed uh, with RNA export uh, to the cytoplasm, and then of course translation, packaging, uh, and assembly into a budding virion. Um, and then the, this late step is also blocked by a number of factors, including tethering. Um, uh, so, so you can see that we've evolved many ways of blocking cellular proliferation or replication, all of which HIV has to overcome. So um, macrophages are important because, of course, these are innate sort of sentinel cells, and they are, they are stuffed full of, uh, of sensors, and, and uh, you know, so mammals don't like their macrophages being um, uh, parasitized. On the other hand, you'll, you know, if you look at the list of uh, pathogens that, 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 that infect macrophages, it's huge, ranging from tuberculosis uh, through to gram-native bacteria to CMV uh, uh, to HIV, of course. So despite being the most switched-on cells we have, they're also the, the sort of favorite niche for many viruses, and it may be because of this ability to traffic to different parts of the of the body. So they're good they're good vehicles for for pathogens. So um, notably, HIV can cause brain disease even under antiretroviral therapy, uh, um, uh, and and this is called um, uh, uh, CNS escape. Uh, and of course, in the in the CNS, we we think that the main target cells are myeloid derived cells, in other words, types of macrophages. Um, uh, and the key thing is here that they're terminally differentiated and long-lived, and they, they tend not to uh, sort of divide. The importance of macrophages has been shown uh, in mouse models where they have, uh, you get BLT mice and you can actually um, uh, populate them with uh, uh, only uh, monocyte derived macrophages and not, uh, and not T cells. And then you can infect those mice. These are, these are BLT humanized mice. You can infect them with HIV and you get a very nice viral peak here, um, suggesting that the macrophages can support infection in, in, in mice in the absence of T cells. If you give AR ARVs, antiretrovirals, you can block that infection, and then you get a rebound sometime later. So, so, so macrophages seem to be a bona fide replication res reservoir. Um, now, we've been interested in how uh, HIV overcomes various blocks, and, and we got really interested in when SAMHD1 was described, um, because this explains some of the restriction uh, phenotypes that were have been observed over decades. Uh, uh, SAM, uh, SAMHD1 is a, um, is, is a protein that is interferon-inducible, and um, functions, uh, its day job is to um, act as a DNTP hydrolase in cells to regulate nucleotide levels, um, uh, balancing ribonucleotide reductase. Of course, cells don't want to have too much in the way of DNTPs around because these are building blocks for, for viruses. So cells are trying to limit how susceptible they are. So that the cells will only switch this, um, will only upregulate DNTP synthesis when it's going to divide, for example, or repair. So, um, so SAMHD1 actually hydrolyzes DNTP. It low, lowers DNTP levels, slows reverse transcription and, and, and polymerization um, and polymerase sort of a, uh, incorporation of D, uh, DNTPs into DNA viruses, um, and crucially is regulated um, by T592 phosphorylation in the protein. Um, and this is regulated by um, cyclin dependent um, uh, but by kinases. So here's a sort of uh, a diagram of how it works. If you've got a cyclin or dividing cell, the SAMHD1. Is, uh, is switched off. In other words, it's, it doesn't have hydrolase activity um, and therefore it can't restrict HIV. Um, and if, um, uh, if, if uh, phosphatase activity is allowed to uh, overcome CDK1 uh, activity, you get um, uh, a non-cycling state. 
uh, where SAMHD1 is on, it's hydrolyzing, DNTP levels are low, and you can block HIV and other viruses. So that's kind of a simplistic representation of how this is regulated within a cell uh, and its effects on a virus. So the question in our minds was, how does HIV overcome SAMHD1? Because it clearly needs to replicate its, its, uh, its genetic material uh, and reverse transcription is, is critical. Um, it was interesting that uh, uh, other, other lentiviruses such as HIV2 and certain SIVs that infect um, monkeys uh, have a protein called VPX. Uh, it's got a small um, protein and actually targets uh, SAMHD1 for degradation via the um, protosome, uh, protosomal pathway. VPX has other, other uh, functions as well, but certainly this was a very early one described that it, it facilitated infection in macrophages and we didn't know why. So, um, uh, and, and, and VPX is actually the, the, the tool that we used, that scientists used to actually isolate SAMHD1 as a restriction factor. So without VPX, we may not have even known this was a restriction factor. Uh, again, highlighting the importance of viruses as tools for molecular biology. So HIV1 does not encode a, a VPX and, and somehow it does infect macrophages. Uh, and whilst being sensitive to SAMHD1. So the question was, well, how is that happening? Um, and we think we, 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 we um, sort of revealed how that's happening in a paper from some years ago now, but um, we um, accidentally figured out that uh, uh, if, you, if you culture macrophages in human serum versus fetal calf serum, you get radically different uh, phenotypes. In other words, um, uh, a, human serum, uh, a human serum cultured macrophage after seven days uh, or six days uh, infected is, is, is not very susceptible, whereas if they're cultured in fetal calf serum, then they're highly susceptible. Um, and you can see here that um, this correlates with, uh, you can see here this sort of an example where uh, HIV um, labeled with the GFP uh, as a sort of um, a lentiviral uh, uh, a delivery mechanism coincides with a G1 state mac uh, uh, macrophage. This is stained for MCM2, which is a marker of G1 entry. Um, and so you can do this over large numbers of cells, and you can see that H, uh, HIV is infecting cells that are, that are MCM2 positive. In other words, it's getting into cells that are in the cell cycle. Um, and this is what happens. This is the number of percentage of positive cells when you stimulate with FCS, that you get a very a much higher proportion that are um, well into the cell cycle, into G1 and beyond. Um, so uh, we, we through, through a very crude mechanism, we we kind of um, pushed the cells into cell cycle. We you could we then did a transcriptomic analysis uh, on FCS cultured cells. You could see that um, they were they were um, high in uh, transcripts associated with cell cycle progression. If, for example, E2F2, CDK1, all of these um, are, are very well known um, in, in 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 proliferative pathways. So you can switch on macrophages and push them through the cell cycle. Uh, they don't divide very frequently, uh, we've shown that, but they go between G0 and G1. Um, uh, we, we then, I mean, those were monocyte-derived macrophages, so you, you're culturing them in MCSF, uh, for example, but we then took mouse proteome macrophages and then stained them for MCM2 and then infected them with HIV, GFP, and even in these primaries, primary macrophages that are not cultured, you can see there's a very, there's a very high correlation between MCM2 positivity uh, with each peak and, and infection. So the, uh, the infected cells are generally MT, MCM2 positive. If you knock out SAMHD1, uh, and these are knockout mice provided uh, by Jan Rehrink in Oxford, um, if you knock out SAMHD1, uh, then you get infection regardless of the, um, the, the cell cycle state. So you, re you, just, you remove the requirement for cell cycle um, entry if there's no SAMHD1, suggesting that's the restriction factor that's being switched off. This is the quantification of all of that. Um, uh, so the question then is obviously how this is working. We showed up regulation of reverse transcripts, but then we needed to show the proteins were upregulated, of course, and Western blotting quite clearly shows that these um, cell cycle associated proteins are, uh, are increased in, in FCS cultured macrophages. Uh, they're part of a canonical pathway that starts at the top with growth factors and mitogens uh, triggering ERK1, 1, 2, which then activates um, cyclin D and CDK4, 6. This, um, this D represses um, uh, the, um, the, the RB protein, which then can activate E2F, uh, uh, the E2F transcription factor, and then you get uh, downstream activation, things like um, CDK1 uh, and various other cell cycle associated um, proteins. So that's the part where we thought we had activated. Um, then we were kind of thinking, okay, well, we know um, 
what's happening, why the virus is, why the cells are becoming more sensitive or uh, susceptible to infection. Can we block it? Because remember, our, our, pre, our premise to all this was, can we limit macrophage reservoirs? So we, we chose HDAC inhibitors. This is histone deacetylase inhibitors, um, um, partly because they were in the fridge, I think, but you know, they've also been used quite a lot in reactivation of HIV from latency. So, so actually, they are a, they're, they're actually uh, associated with, with with increased transcription, increased proliferate, um, increased act, uh, HIV um, uh, production. But we wondered whether they could also block uh, HIV activity because, of course, they were initially licensed for treatment of cancer. So we figured that they they, they may actually limit cell cycle progression. So we chose Saha. This is um, uh, uh, called Varinostat. And you can see here, these are nuclei, um, uh, target cells, target macrophages, HIV, GFP. You can see here that if you um, if you use SAHA, um, you can essentially um, uh, uh, block virus infection. In other words, there's no green here because basically the SAHA is uh, blocking infection. If you knock out SAMHD1 by sRNA, you can restore infection. So here's suggesting that SAHA is, um, is, is, is act acting through SAMHD1. Uh, you can also see here what Saha is doing is um, uh, um, blocking CDK1 here. You can see there's no CDK1 in that lane uh, when you have um, uh, Saha present. Uh, and of course, when you use um, SAMHD1 knock, knock down here, we've not, in, not completely knocked it down, but of course you can then restore infection in the presence of the um, of, of Saha. So, 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 uh, so we feel that this is, uh, this is evidence for the fact that you can block the cell cycle, activate SAMHD1, and block HIV using a drug that's actually uh, clinically approved and in many trials for um, HIV cure strategies. So we think that you know uh, one mechanism of, of this being successful might be that you can not only limit transcriptional activity in production, but you might be able to make cells resistant to, 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 to infection by using this drug so that you limit the reservoir size um, as part of that strategy. Um, we've then moved on to to, to look at other uh, sort of cancer drugs. We we chose top personalized inhibitors, uh, um, uh, and we first checked that top and, and these are drugs like etoposide, capsaicin, again part of chemotherapy regimens. You can see that they do generate DNA damage through gamma H two AX and fifty three BD one, um, uh, and uh, uh, here you can see the the effects on infection if you increase the dose of these drugs. And these are macrophages. Uh, uh, cultured in FCS, so they're in the cell cycle, you can see that etoposide, has, there's a dose-dependent effect uh, for both of those drugs. Um, all, uh, and in terms of cell survival, you can see that um, the, the capsaicin is, is, is a bit toxic at these high doses, but even at, at sort of one micromolar here where there's not much toxicity, you're seeing uh, quite a, a big hit to infection uh, uh, using that, when you use that drug. So that's for HIV-1. You can see, so using etoposide etop, um, or capsaicin, you can block HIV. We did some controls here just to see uh, whether you could block all types of viruses. So we tried, uh, here's um, uh, some leaky forest virus, um, um, uh, HSV, um, adenovirus, and then there is, um, uh, this is an SIV, and then HIV-2. All of these, these two have S a VPX, and these, of course, are unrelated RNA, the RNA viruses and, and the DNA virus. Um, you can see that that the etoposide has no effect on the, the, uh, these viruses, um, and and it doesn't really have much of an effect on the the the, the lentiviruses with VPX, probably because uh, we postulate because SAMHD1 um, is not present there. You can see the, the Western blots. These viruses, um, uh, the, the the lentiviruses are basically um, degrading SAMHD1, uh, and we think that's why there's no block when you when you activate SAMHD1. Of course, in the HIV. Variants here, these are capsid variants in 74 DP90A. You can see that um, it doesn't matter which type of HIV you use, etoposide will have a drastic effect on infection. So you're basically um, uh, uh, causing, we think we're causing a cell cycle arrest, SAM HD1 activation. You can see it's, it's, uh, it's expressed there, and you get blocked to infection. Um, if you do sRNA for SAM HD1, you again can abrogate that effect so that chemotherapy. I think this is quite remarkable, actually. So those really toxic drugs, you know, that we use for chemo um, cannot limit HIV infection in a macrophage if you remove SAMHD1. So um, quite striking. So we, we, we've we shown that uh, chemotherapy agents can, can um, uh, block cell cycle and, uh, and limit uh, viral infection with lentiviruses. Uh, we then extended our work to uh, um, other danger signals. So that's the kind of theme of what we're doing. Uh, another danger signal, of course, is LPS, as uh, Tamil has shown us. It is expressed in um, all, pretty much all um, uh, gram-negative bacteria. Um, 
and um, we wanted to see whether this could activate SAMHD1 because it's a, it is a it should be sensed to the danger signal by a macrophage. Again, macrophages don't want to be parasitized by gram-negative bacteria. So um, we first showed uh, uh, here we show that um, uh, that that LPS can activate SAMHD1, but it's not. And, and then we wanted to obviously figure out which pathways are involved. So we did an experiment where you take macrophages, you challenge them with LP, purified LPS, um, and you can see. Uh, that the infection takes a big hit when you when you have it LPS you go from about twelve percent infection to nothing, uh, um, and of course the the, the sandwich D one doesn't change but the phosphorylation status completely changes right you've uh, you've uh, you now um, dephosphorylated that um, because of cell cycle arrest um, you can see the CDK one is gone in other words the cells are arrested um, and uh, 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 if you if you try and mimic the effect of LPS using something called tenacin which is found in extracellular matrices when they're damaged. Uh, this also has been shown to activate TLR4, but in a different way, um, and it, it, that's actually MyD88 dependent. If you'd use tenacin, you don't get any effect on infection, you don't block it because it's actually using a different mechanism to activate TLR4, it's MyD88 dependent. Um, uh, similarly, flagellin acts through TLR5 and also goes through MyD88, again, no effect on HIV uh, infection. So it is quite specific for a certain aspect of TLR4, and we postulate it's because it's not going through here, it's going through this other pathway that doesn't it relate to NF-kappa B, it relates to IRF3. So then we go, go ahead and test that um, by looking at the IRF3 uh, pathway here. Um, so, so this is what I'm showing you here. So uh, we're testing various stages here. And we start, start at the beginning. So TAP242 is a blocker of, the, of, of TLR4. Um, and you can see here that, uh, first of all, the, here are the controls, negative and positive. So uh, LPS blocks infection again. If you block if you block uh, uh, TLR4, uh, uh, then with TAP242, then LPS has no effect, as we expect. Um, if you block uh, further down here with BX795, uh, you can uh, you can see that um, uh, that the LPS is still able to um, uh, uh, um, uh, block infection, um, um, su suggesting that the activation signal comes is somewhere between here and here, and we're sort of thinking that TRIF might be involved. You can see that the cell cycle associated proteins are um, uh, reflect the amount of infection. The figure over here is just looking at nuclear translocation of, of uh, NF kappa B and RF3, and um, and as expected, uh, type 242 blocks uh, translocation of both RF3 and NF kappa B. These two pathways, um, because it's acting very high, very upstream, um, and the more downstream um, actors um, such as the uh, BX795 affect. Um, uh, don't affect NF kappa B, of course, because this is on this side of the pathway, um, uh, and 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 uh, NF kappa B is on the MyD88 side. Um, but of course, but you do see that BX795 can block RF3 translocation, so um, uh, suggesting that that, that that the block is here. Roxotinib on the end, of course, is blocking. Uh, this is a JAK stack that inhibitor, so this is not blocking interferon. Uh, or three or the producer cell uh, sort of cytokines, or it's blocking uh, the the target cell. So blocking the target cells, of course, is irrelevant, um, and you still get this translocation of of transcription factors. So um, so I've shown you that LPS um, ar arrest cells as a danger signal, as we predicted. Um, we're trying to figure out what the mechanism was. We think it might be TRIF dependent. If you knock down TRIF here, uh, um, uh, then you can. Uh, uh, of course, the knockdown's not bad. It's not fantastic. Um, you get a, um, a, a sort of partial uh, a phenotype here. So you can see that uh, this is looking at RF3 translocation. Um, we know that this shouldn't be affected. NF kappa B should not be affected by any of these because TRIF is in a different pathway. So we're focusing here on RF3. Um, um, and you can see that um, uh, TBK1 knockdown uh, uh, essentially um, uh, abrogates RF3. In other words, the cells are not responsive anymore. Um, uh, and you get a partial restoration by TRIF. So we think that, that, that this is happening at, at the sort of the TRIF level. If you've got transcripts um, associated with cell cycle, you can see again that um, LPS triggers um, uh, uh, sort of negative regulators of the cell cycle, um, uh, as you can see, and, 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 the, the, and the cyclins are downregulated here in blue, and the negative regulators are upregulated as predicted. So you're activating a transcription program uh, that, uh, that clearly regulates cell cycle, um, and we think it's localized somewhere around the, RF, the, TRIF, um, the TRIF stage. Um, we uh, then wanted to show, well, we've been using LPS all the way through, that's just purified protein. So what about the real bac bacteria? So we get some E. coli that are, that, are, that basically are, are red. Uh, and you can see here the macrophages infected with these photo um, bacteria. Um, and you can basically recapitulate that um, uh, all of those phenotypes. In other words, uh, a blockade of L um, TLR4 
um, uh, prevents uh, immune, immune sensing um, and activation of R3, um, uh, and and as as does as does BX, and this can be um, uh, uh, and rock source and has no effect. So the the so the model here is that um, bacteria such as E. coli activates the R4, uh, goes through the trip is activated, and 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 through an unknown mechanism, uh, G0 arrest is triggered. In other words, um, the the program. Uh, the cell cycle um, uh, progression program is is switched off, and this has an effect on some HD phosphorylation, as I showed you, um, which uh, then blocks HIV. Again, we're using HIV as a, a kind of tool to probe what's going on uh, within cells. Um, so we've shown you lots of sort of slightly artificial sort of drug-related thing things in terms of blocking the cell cycle, but we were really then interested whether you know what's what's the relevance for reservoirs? Are there signals or conditions within um, humans that that promotes infection of macrophages rather than blocking. So, how do we become more susceptible to to infections such as HIV? And in other words, are there physiological drivers of, of progression? Uh, and we, one of the early observations we made is that if macrophages are co-cultured with um, CD4 positive T cells, uh, as shown here, this is macrophages from T cells um, from the same donor, then you can drive the cells into into G1. So you can see um, MCM2 upregulation here when you've got CD4 positive T cells. If you put a transwell in between and others block the contact, you can you can block that process. So suggesting that um, cell contact can uh, can can lead to cell cycle progression. We did some first phosphoproteomics, uh, and the pathway that sort of was highlighted again was a cell cycle related pathways involving mechanerk. Um, so uh, these these are um, uh, observations we haven't taken forward because um, uh, um, because of uh, various factors, including COVID. But that what we're hoping to do is probe the actual, um, you know, figure out what the actual interaction is between the T cell and the macrophage that's causing this. Um, we think that it could be um, um, uh, proteins on the CD4 cell surface, for example, um, EGFR, um, or whether there's some kind of um, cytokinic se uh, secretion going on after cell-cell contact. So, so that's that's one bit of work in progress as a result. But we think this is probably going to be an important physiological driver. Of course, I showed you that lymph node right at the beginning. That lymph node is packed full of um, uh, lymphocytes and and macrophages all touching each other. So so that's the sort of physiological environment we 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 think that we should be studying. Um, just wanted to sort of uh, close with the last sort of ten minutes with um, uh, with some work that we've done with with James Nathan, who's here um, on um, on on oxygen conditions, and of course. Um, when we do cell culture, and all of the experiments I've shown you have been in 20% oxygen, when you look at lymph node, the, the oxygen tension is anywhere between 1 and one and 5%, right? Um, and so the experiments we do um, at room, at, in, under uh, atmospheric conditions could be misleading. So um, we, we, we thought we'd look at the effect of, of hypoxia. We call it hypoxia, but in fact, this is normoxian tissues. Um, and this is the sort of HIF pathway. Uh, I'll just sort of say that... Um, <clears throat> that uh, the, the body senses high, low oxygen tensions using um, protein wall HIF, HIF 1 alpha and HIF 2 alpha, which is hypoxia inducible factor. Um, uh, these things called PhDs, prolyl hydroxylases, are oxygen sensors. And when there's lots of oxygen around, um, uh, the, the prolines here in the HIF, 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 HIF 1 alpha and HIF 2 alpha are hydroxylated. And in that, under those conditions, they engage um, uh, von Hippel Lindell uh, protein, so VHL, and this um, uh, uh, binds HIF. Um, and, uh, and and targets it for degradation, and that prevents the HIF from entering the nucleus, where it will trigger a transcriptional program uh, to respond to hypoxia. So, if you're hypoxic, this thing doesn't happen. Uh, uh, VHL uh, is unable to target this for degradation, and HIF enters the nucleus and activates a, a response program. So that's how it's regulated. Quite complex. Um, so we did some, some early experiments, and actually it was quite amazing. So, so Bo sitting here did these experiments, and um, uh, uh, pre COVID. Uh, and what we did is we cultured macrophages from aphoresis cones. We, uh, um, uh, using um, um, sort of um, a chamber, we were able to control the level of oxygen. We, we um, cultured them for um, a total of six days. And blue is hypoxia, and red is normoxia. You can see here that if you, um, uh, and we used a FCS as our positive control fetal calf cell, and we knew that if this would drive the cells into G1. You can see MCM2 upregulated. Phos lots of phosphorylated SAM. Uh, there's a bit of CDK1 there. Um, uh, now, if if you um, uh, um, and, and these are the the, the, hypo the hypoxic conditions, you can see here that um, you've upregulated. You've got even more MCM2, 
and you've upregulated HIF1 alpha here in response to hypoxia and HIF2 alpha. So, so, so this was suggesting that if you um, culture your macrophages in hypoxic conditions, then you can drive them essentially to express cell cycle associated proteins. Um, and we're quite sort of surprised at that. Um, uh, and if you quantify this, you can show increase in expression of MCN2, CDK1, these are classical, some of the classical sort of cell cycle progression proteins. Phosphorylated SAM HD1 also goes up, um, uh, 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 but overall levels of SAM HD1 uh, do not appear to go up, at least at day eight. So you, you're getting the sort of um, program activated that I showed you earlier uh, with FCS, and we're doing this with oxygen. Um, uh, we then want to know if the MECO pathway is involved, which is that classical pathway I showed you earlier. Um, um, and so the first thing we did is um, we looked at HIV infection as our sort of indicator. Um, and uh, indeed, in hypoxic conditions, you can increase infection by about three or four fold um, uh, and concomitant with upregulation of MCM2 and phosphorus SAM and CDK1. So HIV is a very, again, a very good indicator of how, um, uh, how much um, um, cell cycle progression is happening. You can see here that in hypoxia, there are more green cells than normoxia for HIV. Interestingly, and as expected for HIV2, remember that's a, that's a virus which carries VPX. It will knock out SAMHD1, and therefore the cell shouldn't care about hypoxygen tension because there's no restriction factor. You can see here that the SAMHD1 is indeed um, uh, um, depleted. Uh, uh, the cell, the hypoxia does upregulate CDK1 as it should. Uh, it does upregulate MCM2. And yet the infection doesn't go up. In fact, it goes down a bit. So there's no increase in infection by driving into the cell cycle. And the reason is because um, HIV2 doesn't really care about SAMHD1 as a restriction factor. It's, it was amazing that it was so simple and there wasn't more going on, but it seems to be a, the dominant block. Um, down here is some, some um, data showing that you can block uh, the MECO pathway with this drug U0126 in hypoxic conditions. And if you do that, uh, you basically, um, you, you, you lose CDK1 uh, because you're blocking the pathway right at the top. So CDK1 can't get activated. And of course, CDK1 phosphorylates SAMHD1. And of course, now it's not phosphorylated because the CDK1 is gone. So you can see that that, um, uh, that pathway is blocked. And palcosiblib is an anti-cancer drug targeting CDK4 and 6. That does exactly pretty much the same thing. So, uh, and this is the effect on infection. You basically kill infection by using these MECA inhibitors that, that really target that pathway of cell cycle regulation. Um, we then got into, um, uh, so, so obviously uh, James was advising us all the way through and he said, why don't you try and mimic um, hypoxia with uh, some drugs so you can get these PhD inhibitors that basically make the cell think that they're hypoxic. And, um, uh, and indeed um, the cells think they're hypoxic because uh, if you put any of these, these drugs in, DA and IOX2 in particular, you can see that you upregulate HIF and 1 alpha and 2 alpha, and you phosphorylate some HD1. So you can, and this is all done in 20% oxygen. So you can now do these cell, these experiments in the standard uh, tissue culture lab, and you can trick the cells into thinking they're hypoxic and they upregulate all the right things. And in fact, uh, they also uh, become more permissive to HIV because they've switched off some HD1. Uh, and if you block uh, those, uh, if you add these drugs, remember those cell cycle inhibitors to the system, you can completely kill infection. So the, this, these, 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 um, these molecules that are used in uh, being trialed therapeutically are actually able to recapitulate hypoxia very well in our system. Um, so then we're trying to figure out what the mechanism uh, is. Of course, you've got HIF one alpha and HIF two alpha. The papers showing that HIF two alpha pr uh, um, promotes proliferation via CMIC, which is a transcription factor. There are papers showing that HIF one alpha is an arrest causes an arrest signal. So we kind of thought based on looking at some of these things, well, we kind of thought, well, maybe HIF2 alpha is the one that's working in macrophages to promote cell cycle progression. But, you know, of course, James is not again. <laughs> um, uh, so, 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 so we, we wanted to look at where, which one it could be. Um, uh, we looked at some target genes, uh, HIF1 alpha target genes and HIF2 alpha target genes. Um, all of them were increased in hypoxia. So uh, as expected, because both pathways are active in um, hypoxic macrophages, as you might expect. We just believe that there may be a relative um, uh, dominance of one over the other. Um, so then we've got this drug. There's this drug uh, called PT. I can't remember what it stands for. But so so there's a drug that we've used here at different uh, concentrations. It's specific for HIF2 alpha. The key thing to show you here is that the 
the drug that's supposed to target HIF2 alpha tolerogens indeed reduces the trans the the, you know, the, the amount of uh, the, the transcripts of 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 um, uh, HIF2 alpha uh, HIF2 alpha target genes. Um, whereas it doesn't have an effect on the HIF1 alpha target gene. So there's a specific drug for HIF2 alpha here, which is which is what we thought we'd take advantage of. And um, indeed, uh, if you um, if you if you if you culture the cells in low oxygen, um, uh, you get uh, of course you get an upregulation of these cell cycle proteins. But then if you put the drug in, you can you can you can reduce the expression of those cell cycle associated proteins because um, HIF, because we believe that HIF2 alpha has been blocked, um, and indeed it blocks HIV infection as well in dose dependent manner. You can see here a drop in HIV infection uh, despite good cell viability, which I haven't shown you. Um, so this this drug that specifically blocks HIF2 alpha seems to re partially reverse the cell cycle um, uh, um, phenotype and re is reflected in HIV infection. So we're thinking H HIF2 alpha seems to be uh, a candidate. Um, we did a transcriptomic analysis in collaboration with James's group, and then uh, and, and one of the, the top hits in terms of uh, uh, was uh, e EGLN3, which is P uh, encodes uh, PHD3, um, uh, and we wonder whether PHD3 might be related to HIF2 alpha. There is a paper sort of su suggesting there's a link between them, although we've got sort of work in progress. So we're trying to find a mechanistic link between why macrophages are driven through the cell cycle by um, hypoxic conditions, whereas other people observe that. HIF1 alpha potentially arrest cells. So, um, uh, and of course, von Hippel Lindau syndrome, uh, which uh, causes renal cell carcinoma, is due to mutations in VHL that stop it from degrading um, uh, um, uh, HIF2 alpha. Uh, sorry, HIF. So, just to sort of sum up um, and, and sort of see where we're going with this, um, we want to know how the method pathway interacts with PhD and HIF during hypoxia. Um, we want to know what the, hypo the implications of hypoxia and progression are on macrophages. In other words, um, not only HIV, which we've shown, uh, we want to know whether other, bacteri other bacterial pathogens um, uh, are also affected by this. Of course, they also have to copy their DNA when they replicate. Um, uh, we, want to, we would like to know what the effect is on the innate immune responses. And I think that there's, uh, there's very high likelihood that G1 cells um, respond differently to uh, uh, stimuli such as LPS. We have some prelim data, haven't shown you here. Um, and then we think that this has implications for tumors because tumor-associated macrophages or TAMs uh, are, are, are often in hypoxic environments in tumors. Uh, and of course, their function may be regulated by the oxygen tension. And of course, I've got to mention COVID-19 um, because uh, part of the pathogenesis of this is thought to be uncontrolled macrophage activation in severe disease. And the evidence for that is the fact that IL-6 blockers work, jack step blockade works, and of course, steroids work. And these are all immune modulators. So. Um, uh, so, so, and there are papers suggesting that alveolar macrophages um, are throwing out lots of uh, IL-1 beta, for example, uh, in, in mouse models of, of COVID-19. So, so, so the cell cycle state as a hypoxia may be uh, a key driver of this sort of um, uncontrolled uh, um, immune stimulation or activation in COVID-19. Um, and just, just taking a step back from the sort of implications, um, the sort of key observations here are that Macrophages reversibly transition between G0 and G1, so it's not a one-way street, um, although I didn't really show you the conclusive data behind that. Um, uh, G0 arrest is a response to danger signals, as you'd expect. The, the, the cell knows there's something around it doesn't want to be parasitized, so it, it arrests. This transition will to toggle SAMHD1 through phosphorylation uh, uh, via MEC-ERK that culminates in CDK1 activity, which directly impacts phosphorylation. And of course, HIV-1 doesn't need um, a, a SAMHD1 antagonist like VPX because it's learned to, or its, it's, its niche is to infect macrophages that are already in G1, and therefore it doesn't need VPX. Of course, other work um, uh, uh, shows that VPX is needed for other functions uh, uh, um, that in terms of um, um, uh, optimal replication. And then really the implication of this for HIV is that hope, the cell cycle status through genetics or epigenetics or environment might influence the res HIV reservoir size. Uh, it can be manipulated by drugs and, and these sort of these sorts of uh, issues will be kind of important, I think, when we talk about cure um, uh, of HIV. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank uh, members of my lab, uh, obviously my collaborators um, around the world, including Ari in, um, in Durban, at UCL and Oxford, and of course, the Lister Institutes and welcome for funding a lot of this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, 
So uh, and it's always troubled me that we do all of our research is based uh, on in vitro experiments. Oh, thank you. Uh, all of our research is based on in vitro experiments that are not at physiological oxygen. And when you do them at physiological oxygen, you get different answers. So uh, the whole of the world's biomedical research community is wasting a lot of its time, I fear. Um, do you want to speak to that, Ravi? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, based on what we've shown, I, I think um, that's true. I mean, uh, the nice thing is that those those PhD inhibitors can recapitulate hypoxia. Whether it recapitulates hypoxia for every cellular process, I don't know. Um, maybe James can speak to that. But I think that um, that I think you're right. That that really, given the big differences we're observing, that that then I think, you know, ideally every experiment should be repeated at at a lower oxygen tension, if if possible. Yeah, firstly, Ravi, uh, uh, yeah, a, a common, I, I think, hypoxia, yes, for HIF pathways, certainly PhD inhibitors work, whether other effects of oxygen, which is still many um, on other cellular pathways, it may, may well be independent of those drugs. Um, but, but just re regarding the tumor associated macrophages, uh, I mean, it, it might be interesting to look, and, and I don't know if there's any literature there yet anyway, HIF2 inhibitors are typically used or in late phase clinical trials for, for treating um, metastatic renal cell cancers mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it may well be possible to um, look at the tumor associated macrophages in a non-infectious context mm -hmm. um to, to see whether they have something related to that because because I, I don't know that they'll be the same but, but um i mean do, do, you, do you know that tumor associated macrophages behave in any way similar to no to i mean the, the tam literature again is really diverse and confusing in terms of the you know and, uh, so so i haven't really got a handle on it um i think we'd have to speak to some experts in that in that field to connect the dots up i think but you know. i had a question can you understand the basis for how phosphorylation of sam hd1 inhibits its activity oh, it's been a bit controversial yes um yes so so um it's thought to be a conformational rearrangement in the active site where it hydrolyzes the DNTPs, but you know because it's a tetramer, um, it's been rather difficult to explore because you can also people are also showing that uh, phosphorylation of other sites can also have an impact on that process, and there's a whole sort of uh, area of research of um, the effect of SAMHD phosphorylation on linear DNA, for example, viral DNA or reverse transcribed DNA. We have some data suggesting it can inhibit integration, for example, but we don't know how that's working. Um, yeah, so. And I didn't quite understand. You say HIV2 actually affects us by degrading some mm. HD1, but why doesn't it just enter cells during G1 then when HIV1 does? Well, it, prob it probably does, but it, the, the key thing is that let's say 50% of your cells are in G0 and 50% of G1, you can then have, you have 100 cells to infect rather than 50. Um, and that balance will change. And of course, VPX has other functions, for example, um, overcoming um, or, or, or enabling uh, uh, integration and then also overcoming hush, I think. Is that right? Which is a, uh, which Paul showed as a repression, repressor for, 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 for viral elements. Very nice talk. Can I just ask about your uh, experiments with different levels of oxygen? You tested 20% yeah. and 1%. I'm wondering what happens in the in between, as in, is it a effect that's zero one at a certain yeah. oxygen level, or does it yeah. aggregate with? Um... I'm going to ask Bo now because I can't remember. We did this a while ago. Did you do five? I think did you do five at all? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. These are fairly laborious things to do. So it's um, and of course you have to set the chamber at one. You can't only only had only had one chamber. I think so. Of course. You, yeah. Question. Yeah, it's a great question. Exactly. Is it linear? Is it linear or is there a, a point at which the cell kind of switches from one cell? I think that's really important. Reviewers probably ask us that. I think. They should. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've got some yeah. experiments to do. <laughs> so I've got one more. Uh, Ravi, I've always wondered, uh, given that the, both the Boston patient and the London patient had, by definition, a limited or finite level of follow up, what's happened to them since? Are the cures still intact? Uh, yes, the, the London patient is still uh, is still negative, and uh, 
the Berlin patient died, so we, we don't know. And actually, the Berlin patient was on uh, on HIV drugs towards the end because he didn't want to, um, because of the risk of him infecting someone else during unprotected mm -hmm. sex. I mean, that was, you know. So that means he was positive, was he? Well, no, he was just doing it for prophylaxis. But I mean, the problem is that you couldn't really demonstrate that he was cured beyond about seven years. Um, but not, not many people know that. Okay, probably we don't want to get that in the field. But, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so he was at least sort of seven years with no detectable um, HIV. Yeah. No, I think that he, because there's a theoretical risk of infecting someone, I mean, he thought he was cured, but, you know, he was being free and easy, let's say. And um, he was you. He was you. Never. But also, it was because um, it was also so he wouldn't get super infected. So the, the key thing was that um, he was also protecting himself from being infected, from an, uh, reinfected. Is well, there well, theoretical risk of an X4 virus that could use that could still infect cells? I think it was yeah. more for that. Okay, because there's not much point curing people if you can't convince them they're cured. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Um, I think. So it looks like all the questions, people at the back, anything from you guys? You're a long way back up there. Um, so we're not finished yet. Alex, would you like to take over and close the meeting? Thanks. So thank you, Ken. Um, well, it's uh, it's always a pleasure to be here, actually. It makes the, the hair stand up on the back of my neck when I drive into Addenbrooke's Hospital from uh, my ex fantastic experiences here 40 plus years ago, actually. Um, but we've certainly heard two outstanding talks today from our two new prize fellows in the Lister Institute. Uh, delighted to welcome you. Um, and we wish you every success going forward. Uh, really, today, absolute tour de force, actually. Uh, so, I personally, congratulations to you both. And I'm, I'm, I'm often struck by, um, by what the Lister Institute might do in terms of putting together groups of its fellows who work in highly complementary areas. And the biofilms, we must have, what, five current fellows who all work on your problem from a slightly different angle and, and lots of people who work on the Mac, Jan Raywinkle up there, yeah. uh, Musa Nifa, who work on the macrophage in all its glory. And, and you know, what you guys have got in the biofilms area, there's a, a venture capital world out there that is desperate to fund high quality uh, antibiotic resistance companies and and you guys would be one instantaneously it, it, we should think about these things anyway my first comments are to the audience actually um the closing date for lister institute applications is september the cutoff for applications is 10 years after phd and could I please encourage the younger members of the audience, he said, staring at the four souls who are still here, to think about applying, because this is unique support. It's money that comes with no strings attached. And one of the sad things about the UK and the international funding environment for research is that every penny you get these days tends to be committed to doing some bloody experiment or other. Mm -hmm. And therefore, innovation has gone out of our equation. Uh, this money is priceless. So please apply. It's uh, competitive. But actually, I think the process, talking to people who've applied over the years, is that the process is hugely beneficial because as you've seen today, it makes the applicants put their research into the context of their whole careers, not just a series of experiments you're gonna do for the next three years, but what, what is your work going to achieve over possibly 40 years? Um, the other thing is a comment to our two prize winners, of course, although the checks are very welcome, I'm quite sure, I think equally important is that is the fact that you join in a community which is unique in UK and probably world science. 
uh, with mentors at every level, with peer, a peer group which is second to none. And I think that is something that you really ought to uh, keep in mind. And, and there are many of us, even in the audience, who uh, will always support a list of fellow in whatever way we possibly can. It's, I always have a, a little bit of a, a trip down memory lane about the Lister because it, it, it breaks my heart the way the Lister has been airbrushed out of British biomedical scientific consciousness. Now, this is an organization that has been going since 1891. It started by, by the Guinness family, actually, when, um, and, and the Guinness family, are a complicated bunch, as well as their products, which we're all very familiar with and have enjoyed to access more than once. Um, the Guinness family were were actually based in Suffolk. So, and, and Guinness, the brewery started in Dublin long before Ireland was an independent country. So back into the 19th and, and even 18th century. And the story goes that Guinness, who, who'd been elevated to the peerage in Suffolk, Lord Ivy, I-V-E-A-G-H, had a groom who was bitten by a dog that people thought had rabies. I, I probably doubt the diagnosis a bit, but anyway, Guinness, or Ivy, was disgusted that he couldn't get his groom treated in the UK and had to send him to Paris, where he was treated by Pasteur and survived. Uh, and so Lord Ivy was concerned that Britain should have its own equivalent of the Pasteur Institute. And I guess put together about 40 million in today's money to start the, the institute, which was on the north bank of the Thames opposite Battersea Power Station there. And the, the, the catalogue of things that the Lister Institute did is breathtaking, absolutely astonishing. They they won no numerous Nobel prizes. Obviously, they predated the MRC by twenty five years. Um, the contributions to our understanding of bacteriology in the round was enormous. I mean, they were the people who sorted out what were the bases of any number of bacterial infections, um, and. Also, our understanding of, of the way most of the vitamins work. So fundamental biochemistry, fundamental microbiology. Post the Second World War, they were the people who sorted out what was the, what was the basis for ABO blood grouping. Again, not a minor contribution to uh, human health. And the, the story then goes to, it's tragic. The Institute's insights meant that they were the suppliers of most of the biological products for, for British medicine. They had a farm in Elstree in Hertfordshire where the animals were kept in which the various uh, antigens were raised. And because of the blood group work after the Second World War, they were fundamental to establishing the, the National Blood Transfusion Service. And the money that came from those products all went into running the institutes. What derailed the whole thing was thalidomide. And when the thalidomide crisis uh, arose in the late 60s, there was a, a panicked New Medicines Act, which in 1968 specified that anything for, for use in humans should be produced to, to, to eye-wateringly high standards, GMP. Uh, and of course, the Lister had never kept any money in its coffers to enable it to upgrade its production facilities. So basically, that uh, well-meant legislation had the unintended consequence of destroying the Lister Institute. The, uh, the farm was sold once the, the farm was, once the production was no longer generating an income, the institute couldn't be sustained. And I think that's where Britain really did commit a serious felony uh, in that no money could be found from other sources to keep this remarkable uh, institution going. So 
during the course of the 70s, the, uh, the wheels came off the wagon, the farm was sold, the, inst the institute itself was sold, it's now the Lister Hospital, of course, private hospital on the banks of the Thames, and that money was put into an endowment which through the 80s and 90s funded a number of, of Lister fellowships at the kind of professorial fellowship level, I think one or two usually here in the audience, uh, and come the turn of the millennium, the list had more or less run out of, run out of money. So um, my predecessor, Dame Bridget Ogilvy, who was obviously formerly the chief executive of the Wellcome Trust, put her foot on the football and said, hold on a minute, are we going to let this thing go to the wall or, or does this need to be preserved? She thought it should be preserved. She... She also, I think, realized very sensibly that that kind of professorial fellowship was now being provided by other funders and that the, the limited resources of the Lister were best put towards supporting people at the early stages of establishing their independent careers. So great credit to Bridget Ogilvy for keeping us going. Uh, from 2002 onwards, we've been making awards of prize fellowships. Uh, I think back then when money was a bit tight, and I think we were down to our last 10 million, we were giving two a year out. I, I'm very, I was deter, I was determined actually not to, not to blow it on my watch, and so I thought we're not going to do anything stupid. We're not going to, we're not going to have initiatives, and we quietly let the the finances recover over a decade. So at the moment, we're at about 50 million. And that's meant that we can now award at the, this year eight of these fellowships. And I think, you know, the ambition is to get us up to 10 because I think this kind of funding is so important for British science, actually. So the list is in good shape. There's plenty of money to be competed for, you out there. Um, and I hope you don't mind me taking you down memory lane like that, but but I'm, I've got I'm, I've got rather religion about it. I'm on a bit of a crusade to put the Lister Institute back in the uh, the consciousness of of UK biomedical researchers because I think it deserves to be, and I think we we do ourselves a grave disservice by forgetting about it. So on on Sally's behalf and my own behalf, thank you for your hospitality today. It's always a wonderful privilege to come down to the LMB. Um, there seems to be a, another couple of miles of building around Cambridge every time every time I arrive, um, and I hope you don't the, the weight of it all doesn't drag you down into into the fens. So. Uh, that would be a bit tragic, as our friends across the road at AstraZeneca can probably tell us. Anyway, but let's finish by congratulating our two prize winners, Tom May and Ravi. And, and we've got a, a little bit of a present for you both. Um, both simultaneously. Well, we'll, we'll do... Uh... We'll do one at a time. How about that? Yeah. It's special as we go. <laughs> but, but if you are passing one of these guys' labs, you've got a minute or two to spare. You give yourself a treat and read this book about this. I promise you, it'll be the most interesting hour you've ever spent. It's uh, quite fascinating. So let's go in a ladder of the uh, talks. <laughs> Yeah, you had funny funny Yeah. 